have a message to y'all this morning just about uh just just want to talk to you about the need the need in our world today and and, and how great it, it truly is um sadly we we are creatures of of procrastination um we wait way too long and we know we know what we need to do but we wait and wait and wait until the last minute and um god forbid that god's people should ever be this way um, we should serve as examples to the rest of the world as those who have a job to do and we're doing it right away um if you've ever in the next chapter actually of luke if you've ever asked the lord to teach you how to pray um, has anybody in here ever done that okay one one of you <laughs> was that a hand raise oh that was a thumb all right yeah so I, it's really interesting in luke chapter 11 how the disciples come unto god himself the lord jesus christ manifest in the flesh and they basically pray to him <clears throat> because any talking to jesus in the bible is like a prayer to god and they say lord teach us to pray as uh, john also taught his disciples to pray so were they actually saying like we're praying to you asking you to teach us how to pray like not necessarily. You can see from Jesus's answer to them is that he was actually, they were actually asking, um, how should we pray? What things should we pray for? And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very important question. Um, who knows what all y'all are praying for, but I mean, if you really re know how to pray, or if you really want to know how to pray, you should consider what Jesus actually says in response. Um, because first John actually says that uh, we know that if we ask all thing anything according to his will, we have that which we have received or, or that which we ask. So if you understand that God answers the prayer that's according to his will, then wouldn't you want to know what his will is? Amen. So like Jesus actually gives basically the the will to pray for. Like this is the desire that you should desire. Uh, this is what the, what's God's going to answer. So one of those things is thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven have you ever prayed that before yeah. have you ever considered what that means yeah. what 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 have you considered that it means thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven what would that mean um, start the thousand year reign start the thousand year reign amen it can mean like come lord jesus what's going to happen in the thousand year reign Mm -hmm. um is jesus going to rule yeah. as with an iron scepter yeah. going to shatter the nations in pieces do you think that anything happens in heaven and god says that's against god's will in heaven none at all how quickly do you think it happens Immediately. absolutely in the twinkling of an eye it happens in heaven <laughs> right right yeah you ever you ever gotten on the internet and had a slow internet connection that doesn't happen in heaven god has something that he commands and it happens within a twinkling of an eye immediately so that's actually what we're asking if you truly are asking that thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven you're asking for things to be done in the father's will as quickly as it's done in heaven that means even in your own life so <clears throat> considering that you know um you know it's it's if you understand like what god's will is for you on this earth then uh then you will desire to be used by him and you'll you'll desire those things to happen quickly not not put them off not put them off for tomorrow um and if you realize that god is showing you a great need there's a great need in this world there's a great need of you that god has and you're putting it off and putting it off and putting it off then truly you'd be praying that prayer in vain if you do pray it but you're caught kind of in a predicament because jesus tells you to pray this so if you want to stop praying it then you'll be disobeying the lord which is show you don't love the lord but if you do pray it then that means that you need to pray it in a sincere heart and that means that whatever god tells you to do you want to do it lightning fast just like it's done in heaven 
Um, so what I mentioned about we we kind of wait to the last minute. Um, I was shared an email where uh, I was basically showing that the people that read the Bible literally uh, it paid off. Um, so like back in the 1600s up until the 1800s. There are many people that were reading. There's like John Gill, there's Spurgeon, there's many others reading the Bible and saying Israel is going to come back to her motherland. God is going to bring her back. According to this prophecy, they would show different places in Scripture. They show Ezekiel and things like that. And there's like Israel must come back, you know, and uh, she's God's going to reestablish her in the land. That's what this prophecy shows. Now. Uh, a doctrine that kind of became prevalent after the time that Israel was uh, and, and the Jews were dispersed out throughout the whole world um, was one, one of the things that came up, especially through the Catholic Church, was that uh, the church replaced Israel. Now, Israel did not have a homeland at that time in 70 AD. And so for centuries, she did not have a home. Now, some would argue, well, the people in Israel are not really Jews. I, I don't find that argument to hold any water, really, at all. I mean, it holds some water, but it not, not enough to convince. Well, I don't even know if half of them are converts, because actually what it says, I think less than that. Very, We have a missionary action in Israel, uh, Brother Alex Morovsky, and he's a Ukrainian Jew, uh, converted to Christ, uh, has a Baptist church there. Uh, but I do believe that few still should be saved. Only a remnant of Israel be saved. So most of the Jews there are Jews by, I believe, genealogy, but not by spiritual. Uh, they're not spiritual Israel, as Scripture talks about. And um, and and so the I forgot where I was actually going with that. But the 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 the, uh, the actual uh, testimony uh, of these men that that were believing that Israel was going to come back. Oh, what I was going to say is that. They were actually without a homeland for that many centuries, and there's actually been no people group or no countrymen in the history of mankind that has been that long without a homeland and actually survived. They usually, you know, go into the societies and they all become, they mix with those societies and then they're done. They're the only nation in the history of the world that has survived that long without a homeland. And then they were brought back. But what was astonishing about reading these things that were, that were clearly spoken in the 1800s and all of that is that they came true. So the people that believe that Israel actually, or the church actually replaced Israel, they were at, well, that was one of the arguments they made. Well, I mean, if the church didn't replace Israel, then where is Israel? I mean, God's obviously not pleased with them. He's pleased with the church. Therefore, he replaced them. And then lo and behold, in 1948, Israel was reestablished as a nation. And, you know, there's many, many prophecies that we could talk about uh, that came true. The mightiest ones are about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Like Isaiah 53, written 700 years before he's even born. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He's despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's just six verses. There's six more. Who in history does that describe? That's all it describes. And God gives us these prophecies in Scripture actually telling us that he wants to show us that he is God and, and none else. He says, I tell you the former things from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that not, were not yet done. He says, so that you'll know that I'm God and there is none else. He also even says you can distinguish his work from all other counterfeits. He says, unless you say, I told you from the beginning, unless you said my idol did it or my graven image did it. So he's basically saying, look, every other religion is false. Every other God is false. I am the only true God. Follow me. I'll give you proof by saying I'm going to tell you the beginning before it even happens, and I'm going to cause it to bring it to pass. And he does. And so we can actually say, like, well, if all of that is true, and it, and it was, I mean, I think they said about the prophecies of the Lord Jesus, if one man was to even keep like 13 of them, then it would be like filling the entire state of Texas full of uh, silver dollars, like, you know, putting up a little fence around the state of Texas, painting one of those red, blindfolding yourself, you turning around seven times or something, walking in there, and you finding that one red silver dollar. 
That's the odds of one man fulfilling all of those prophecies. Thir no, just 13. There's like 300 something about the Lord Jesus. Micah 5, 2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, out of thee shall come forth unto me a ruler whose goings forth are from everlasting, from eternity. So this is the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, not from Atlanta, not from Chicago, Bethlehem. There's only certain people that can fulfill these, that could have fulfilled these types of things. The Lord Jesus did. Why did God the Father actually say that he did that? It's so that you and I can know that he's God and there is none else. And so that we could believe him. And, and um, so again, what other things does God talk about that's going to happen? He talks about heaven and hell is going to happen. If we believe God, then we can believe that heaven and hell is going to actually happen. It talks about the Lord Jesus is going to come back one day. Do you believe that? I would just say, if God's already shown you so many things, then you can believe that the Lord Jesus is going to come back. When's he going to come back? Nobody knows. How is he going to come back? Is he going to come back like a thief in the night? He said, for that reason, he said, be ready. In um, Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, it says this. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. I don't know if you realize this or not, but if you look through scripture and then you look through history, you can also see along with the prophecies that God gives, there's other things that he doesn't give, but they look almost exactly like what he's talking about in scripture. You know, many people get confused. They're like, I think this is the Antichrist. And it looks like he is. Antiochus Epiphanes looked like he was the Antichrist, but he wasn't. And I think God gives these things in a sense to almost like show us like history kind of repeats itself. You see that? History repeats itself. In a way, we can look at history and say like, wow, like God has almost maybe given us these things to show us that, you know, uh, you know, this is what it might look like, but get ready because you know it's not it because when it is it, you'll really know uh, in a sense. But I would say what 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 is perfectly actually we can declare from Scripture is that he told these 70 that he was going to come into every place that they were going to go beforehand. So I would say one thing that we could declaratively say perfectly from Scripture is that when the Lord Jesus died and he rose again from the dead, this is before that time. He actually told his disciples, commanded his church to go into where? All the world. One day when the Lord Jesus comes back, he is going to rule over all the world. And if he personally does not come, he's going to send his servants, I think, into all the world to actually judge those people who will not bow the knee. So again, hip history repeating itself. He says he's going to come. He's going to come in, into these, every city and place, go before him. You know, Another way that this actually repeats history is that John the Baptist was first sent before Jesus. And he actually said, prepare the way of the Lord. So in a way, we ourselves are like John the Baptist in which we are crying out, behold the Lamb of God, prepare the way. He's coming again, prepare the way. Verse 2 says, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. Now, one of the things I would say that, 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 that God actually tells us is going to happen uh, before the Lord Jesus comes back is that he says it's going to be like it was in the times of, of Noah. Um, in Matthew 24, it says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So how were the days of Noah? What, are they, what were they characterized as? Wicked. Okay. There were some specific things, though, it mentioned about the days of Noah. In Genesis, I'm sorry? Well, if you are taking note, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 6 uh, verse 5, and then you can read 11 through 13 as well. But it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 11 says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with 
violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So if you actually want to get a pulse of where in times things are, then what is one thing maybe you could look at? Violence. Have y'all ever looked at violence in the world recently? There's actually a website you can go on that actually catalogs all the violence in the world. All the violence. And it actually does catalog. It's not a biblical website. So, I mean, I think you can say it doesn't have a... Uh, uh, it doesn't have an axe to grind, so to speak. It doesn't, it's not trying to prove it just so that you'll, you'll believe in Jesus or anything like that. It's, it's, it's actually just, just saying their, their actual goal is to actually lower the violence, but the violence has been rising. They said over the last decade, it's been rising, you know, kind of significantly. Um, one of the things, though, that I find that even was inaccurate on this website is that um, – they they had I believe um, New Zealand or no it wasn't New Zealand I think it was Iceland Iceland they said was the safest place to live in the world um, yeah what what I would say is is really wasn't accurate about this website is one of the things they mentioned on there was infanticide but guess what they were not counting as infanticide abortion abortion is abortion murder we know it's murder because when you began in your mother's womb, you began as a completely different person. Uh, scripture says that the, actually the fruit of the womb belongs to the Lord. That every single thing that made you a distinct individual occurred at the moment of conception. And that some false, even some, Bible, some, people, some people who call themselves Bible believers actually teach that abortion is not murder because the baby hasn't breathed. And they try to use different verses like in Scripture about how God uh, breathed into Adam the breath of life and then he became a living soul. Or in Ezekiel where uh, God raises the nation of Israel, but they hadn't had the breath of life yet. They're in a valley of dry bones and he breathed into them the breath of life. And, uh, and, and then Job where he says that the breath of the Almighty is in my nostrils. Um, all of these things obviously are taken out of context and really have no really like real application to childbirth. But even if you were to give this person the benefit of the doubt and say, OK, yes, a person must be breathing in order to be alive. I would say I could show you the ultrasound of my son and, and show you him moving around in the womb, nodding, um, you know, kicking his feet, rolling over, things like that. You know why he's doing that? Yeah. And do you think he could be alive without oxygen, without the breath of life? I mean, if somebody was on a breathing machine, would we say they're not alive because somebody else is breathing for them? No. If we have a, a, a machine helping somebody breathe, we wouldn't say, okay, th th I can kill them now because they're no longer a person. They're not alive. Someone else is breathing for them. Well, the baby's breathing for the – or the mother's breathing for the baby. You're just filtering the air down into his blood. So it, it is absolutely murder. Um, God calls what is in the womb not a creature, not a thing, not some clump of cells or anything like that. He calls it a child. It's sad. Like in our in our country, we we will say it's a fetus until you want it. If you want it, then it's a baby. And the nurse was uh, first doing an ultrasound on my wife to to see uh, you know to make sure it's okay because we got in a car wreck. That's where I got this scar from. Uh, but um, but she slipped up. It seemed called it. the fetus is moving. Oh, that's fetal movement. That's fetal. The, the baby is the baby is oh the fetal is going back and forth. I mean, fetus is just a Latin term for a baby. <laughs> in 1970 in Iceland, I believe it was in the 70s, um, uh, abortion was made legal. And since that time, it has increased by 300%. So the safest country on the planet is not safe for the most innocent among them. 
I believe that this itself is a, an idea of the violence in our land, that 3,000 babies a day are murdered in America under the idolatry of choice, what they call convenience abortions. Well, they'll say, well, what if, the, what if they're raped or what if it's incest? That's, I think they say that's like 0.1% of abortions that are committed in our country. Even if we're giving them that, like, okay, well then, yeah, let's just regulate it to that. They would, they wouldn't want that because they think it's still, uh, they think a, a mother should be able to terminate, again, that word terminate, not kill or murder, terminate their baby whenever they want to. Um, violence. Um, what what uh, what this website actually shows is that since 2008, the global level of peace has deteriorated by 2.14 with 80 countries improving while 83 countries deteriorated. Um, the, the own state of our land is, is, is it's definitely filled with violence and, and wickedness. Uh, definitely, we could say the people's hearts in our, in our land are only evil continually. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, we, we have our own Holocaust here in America with about over 50 million uh, of our own being uh, murdered through abortion. <clears throat> so I would say that th that we are very close to as the days of Noah, but you know I was allowed to preach this message at my church and and um and actually like that very night after that morning message that very night and actually I said in the message it's only going to get worse I guarantee you if you think things are bad now just wait and that very night the worst mass shooting that ever happened on American soil occurred uh, with the Las Vegas shooting. And then I think it was the next Sunday that that shooting happened into the Baptist church in Texas. Jesus says in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. These things may overwhelm us, but if anything overwhelms us, Psalm 61, 2 says, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We see, as he mentions here, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world. He says here in verse 2 in Luke chapter 10, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. As we mentioned in Sunday school, the, 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 the love of Jesus Christ uh, is, is really proven in our obedience to his commandments. I will challenge you in this regard. How often do you pray what the Lord Jesus commanded his followers to pray in this verse? How often do you pray, Lord, send forth laborers into your harvest? Is that a part of your regular daily prayers? I would challenge you that if it's not, make it that way. Not because some just rules you must follow without love of Christ, but because you love Christ so much, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. I would tell you it's almost impossible to pray this prayer and, 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 and try to run away from hypocrisy so to speak because what you'll basically if you if you pray this prayer not as a hypocrite you will actually be praying at the same time god make me a laborer make me a laborer there are more lost people in our world today than really there has ever been in the history of the world if you ever just go out i i was thinking when i walked up to the church building i haven't been here in a while but but when we started this church, I think I was here for about a year and a half. And I was thinking about all the, in a sense, you go into, and, and sometimes I'm asked to preach at different churches. I have no idea who they are. I have no idea where their hearts are at. It's, it's kind of difficult. Praise God, you got to just rely on God. But I was, as I was walking up here, I was like, well, I, I do kind of, I have a history with these people. You know, Praise God. Especially Travis and his, his mom, Brother Travis. And, and I was thinking, uh, you know, even when, even before the, I think the first service that we had, I, I, uh, I actually went in just about every single street in this whole uh, area. And I would come back 
like almost every night, and I would think, the harvest is not just great. It's, it's, to me, it seems like it is so, so great. And I wish I would have had somebody with me, but you know what? I didn't. I mean, I did. I had the Lord with me, but I wish I would have had another, another man, another warrior for Christ with me, but there was no one. And I was like, and the laborers are so, so few. What's the answer? Pray. Pray. Pray that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. In verse 3, it says this. It says, go your ways. I love that. It says, you know, he, said, he commanded us all, you know, after his resurrection to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But actually here it shows us, you know, a lot of times we, we think too hard about what God's will is in a sense. And in a sense, he just says, go your ways, do what's right. Walk humbly before your God and hunger and thirst after righteousness as you're going. And I will guide you. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. As lambs among wolves. Granted, you're going forth where ravenous wolves are. But just as he uh, shows us when he resurrected from the dead that he will be with us, he even showed them this. If you could look down on uh, verse 19, he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He says, Don't be afraid of men. As Isaiah says, Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. At the end of the day, that's what man is. There's nothing but a, but, a, but a breath of hot air. That's all he is. Why would you be afraid of him? Jesus said, fear not him who could destroy the body, but rather fear him who could destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. And he says that in, in Matthew 28. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Realize that you are going forth among wolves, and I send you forth as lambs for the slaughter, but I'll be with you. We follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus. He said, take up your cross and follow me. He submitted himself willingly to that cross. Get on the cross with the Lord Jesus. Let men kill you. Let men destroy you. Then You, you ever looked at the postures of prayer in the Bible, the different postures of prayer? You remember how people prayed in Scripture? What are the different ways that people prayed? Yes, looking up to heaven. Jesus looked up to heaven when he prayed. He fell on his face in the garden. He fell on his knees. He prayed all night long. But guess where else he prayed? Between heaven and earth. Have you ever prayed in that position? Make that a goal of your life. Maybe one day I can pray like Jesus did fixed to a cross, being tortured. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. First, I think he had to teach them uh, how to have faith. And because they had faith, they could realize that even if he did say, now, you know, carry a purse, now carry a script, carry it. But you can always revert back to what I taught you before, and that is have faith in me. Trust in me. I'm going to take care of you. So many today, so many missionaries, it's like they won't, they, if they have a burden for a land, they won't go there unless they spend two years on deputation or something. Go, going around churches, gathering money, things like that. I would say, have they first learned to trust in God? Have they first gone out without anything and just trusted God to take care of them? This is a vital lesson to learn because what happens if they're in the field and all their support stops? They're just going to come home. God no longer called them there because all their support stopped. No. Go out. The Lord Jesus basically teaches us. And he doesn't say, trust the brethren. Trust in God. Don't worry about these things. Don't care about these things. As he said, brother, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What are those things? He was talking about what the Gentiles worry about, food and raiment. Don't worry about those things. I'll take care of you. 
And then in verse five, it says, and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. And uh, verse six, it says, and if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. This is pretty awesome as well, because you know what we preach is peace. We actually do preach peace. If someone does reject it, we are to move on. You know, that part of our armor that we wear as as uh, children of God, the Lord's armor is the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith. We have our loins girt about with truth. And then what do we have on our feet? Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We bring peace. We actually want to tell folks that God is offering the conditions of peace today, but there's going to come a day where he is going to judge the world. And we want to find, we, we are in love trying to reconcile you to God. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. You know, that's what the disciples and the apostles learned. Even uh, uh, Paul, even after the Lord Jesus is risen from the dead, he, he, he didn't like always, I would say, just spend a whole lot of time on those that were completely rejecting the message. He would knock the dust off his feet and move on. Maybe the Lord allowed it to come back later and preach to those cities, just like in this case, because he first told them to go through these cities. And then later on, he said, go into all the world. So those people that rejected, you don't spend a lot of time there because there are people that people of peace, so to speak, the son of peace that you can look for and find. God has prepared their hearts. You know, we need to hear the four voices, as it's said. I was thinking about this last night and I think this would be perfect. And y'all, y'all. Hopefully this this would be something good for y'all. You, you know, somebody asks you how you're doing, just tell them I'm hearing voices in my head. That, that I, I think it'd be a great way to, to actually witness to someone. I'm hearing voices in my ear. What? You need to see a psychiatrist? No. Can I tell you what they're saying? I don't know if I want to hear what they're saying, but no, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the voice from above, which God speaks in Isaiah 6 verse 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I'm hearing a voice from below where the rich man who lifted up his eyes, being in torment, actually asked one of God's saints to go unto his brethren and warn them unless they come into this place of torment. And I don't know, maybe one of your family members are in hell right now wishing that I would come to you and warn you unless you come into this place of torment. And then I'm hearing a voice from beyond, like in Macedonia. Where he says, come over here and help us. So I'm hearing voices on earth where there's someone, God's preparing someone's heart and they're actually desiring to hear this message that I have. Maybe it's you. And then I'm hearing a voice from within that's saying, whoa, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It's good to hear those voices, isn't it? Verse 7, and in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they, as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Jesus uh, commended those who would follow him. Sell all you have. Give to the poor and follow me. He commended them. Not necessarily a bad thing to, to have things, but truly love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't put your affection on things on earth, but on things above. Don't put your affection on things on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in to st and steal. He said, because where your heart is or where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So he said, have treasures in heaven. If, if you were to see some like example of a poor missionary, say like in some you know place in Africa or South America that had one pair of of clothes had dirt floors in his house and he just was beaming with the glory of god he had the spirit of god just just controlling him completely full of love and joy and peace and long suffering gentleness goodness and faith he was poor in spirit he hungered after thirst he hungered after righteousness he hungered and thirsted after it and then you're to get a picture of like joel Osteen. god would be like this Follow that man. Stay away from Joel Osteen, who has a $10 million mansion, I believe. And to whatsoever city. So in other words, he's basically saying, like, don't go not from house to house. Do not have this buffet mentality. 
where you're trying to get the best of everything that people give you. Um, but, but be content to be where you're at. Uh, into whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. I'd say in the great commission that we, we see in Matthew 28, where it says, go into all the world and teach all nations, you know, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, it doesn't really say anything about like raising the dead and healing the sick and things like that. Things I don't, I'm not necessarily against. I'm not against praying for people that are sick and seeing miracles, God doing these things. But, um, but it does say preach the gospel in a sense of when, when men are talking to Paul about even, um, about arguing, you know, in Corinthians about who baptized them. Paul is like, Christ sent me not to baptize. I would say like, it's not, it's not like I'm baptizing people in my own name, but to preach the gospel. And it's, it's something to realize that, that, um, that people have sin sick souls, you know, that, that if anyone is, is ever sick, it's because, as we mentioned again in Sunday school, that, that it's because of sin in their life. Either it's a, a sin they actually committed and it can be directly tied into that, or it's just just due to sin in general, you know. Um, and, and because of this, that's why sin, death, and suffering comes into the world. Our sickness, death, and suffering comes into the world because of sin, right? So... I find an interesting analogy or metaphor here where he's saying, heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. You know, it's, we have an amazing thing to offer the world. And that is the balm of Gilead, the Lord Jesus Christ, who can save a sin sick soul. And, uh, and, the we, and the reason that we can say the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you, like they're, they're doing like maybe miracles, but even if a miracle happened to themselves, you know, I heard a man, they asked him a question. They said, uh, they said, have you ever seen a miracle? Have you ever uh, witnessed a miracle? He said, yes, I did. And he was like, what is that? He's like, when I was born again. And they were like, what? <laughs> and he was like, oh, you got to understand, like I was dead. In my trespasses and sins, I live for the world. I love the things of the world. And then all of a sudden, it all changed. God translated me into the kingdom of his son. I started to love him, love righteousness, love his word, love praising him. I wanted to preach his word. That's all I wanted to do. Everybody thought I was crazy. I mean, it was a miracle. In the same way, that's how we experience the kingdom of God. Jesus said that you sh unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Those who have been born again have entered into the kingdom of God. They've been regenerated. They've been, they've entered into the kingdom of God. So in a same sense, we can go to this world and say, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Especially, you know, tell your testimony. If you don't know exactly what to say, that should be a burden of your heart that you tell your testimony. And it's really just three parts, your life before Jesus, how you met Jesus and what, what he changed since then. And then ask them, do you, do you want this same Christ? If they reject it, you can say, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. I'm in the kingdom of God right now. God wants to bring you into his kingdom, but you rejected it. If they, yeah, so in verse 10, it says, but into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For the mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you. They had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it should be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, thou shalt be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And the 70 returned, with, uh, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, <clears throat> even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
It almost seems that even if you're seeing people sick, being made whole or seeing people lame, seeing them walk, like even that's not very powerful because some of these devils, which would actually, uh, you know, like the, the young boy who is would uh, foam at the mouth and, ca- and the devil would cast him into the fire and things like that. Like, like, like if that was removed from him and yet he still had the devil within him, as Jesus said, that could even happen that, that a devil can be cast out of someone. And, and because the spirit of God is not in that person, that that devil will go out and find, you know, six, seven more spirits stronger than themselves. And they'll come back in the latter state will be worse than the first with that man. So just casting devils out is not really a big deal. The question is, is are their names written in heaven? If you've been saved and preached at all to anyone, you might have gone away and said before, that was, that was horrible. I wish I could have done better. I asked, you know, you could ask folks like, how did I do? I thought you did all right. I mean, how do you think you did? (sighs) Just reflect back on this. Well, it doesn't matter how I did. My name's written in heaven. And I'll rejoice. The strange joy of Jesus also in verse 21, it says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. I mean, this is, this is truly is astonishing and, and, and kind of encouraging as well as that Lord Jesus really doesn't go up to like Ivy League schools like Oxford and other places like that and look for people. He goes for those who actually recognize that They're poor in spirit, that they're not very wise. They're not very smart. He didn't call many wise. He didn't call many noble. But he called the the base things and the weak things of this world unto him. And he that's why he rejoices. You've hid these things from the wise and prudent, and you've revealed them unto babes. And then he actually turns to them and tells them, Blessed are your eyes, because you've seen these things. Blessed are your ears, because you've heard these things. Do you realize that at the time of him saying this, that this was not written? It's it's astonishing. They were seeing it lived out in front of them. You know, when he was transfigured on the mount, they, they, you know, Peter even said that that, uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Like even seeing the Lord Jesus transfigured on the mount is not as powerful as the word that we have here. It's amazing. It's like someone not realizing the treasure that they have in their own backyard. Like the story I heard about a man who who uh, was visited by a man who's a jeweler and telling him all about diamonds and how he can be rich, you know, because of these diamonds. If he just finds these diamonds, they're in different places of the world. You just mine for them. You could be a rich man. You have fortunes beyond belief. And, and the man goes and leaves his wife, leaves his family, goes all around the world searching for diamonds, ends up bankrupt, ends up poor, poverty, all that, dies in another land. I guess maybe the man felt some kind of obligation to his family, so he went to the mother and said, I'm sorry for your husband's, your loss of your husband and everything. And she's like, yes, thank you, whatnot. And then he looks over on the mantle and he sees a rock and he's like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's just a rock my kids found in the backyard. And he's like, he looks at it and he's like, this isn't any normal rock. And he's like, this is a diamond. And they started digging in the backyard. And it's actually, a true story, is actually one of the biggest diamond mines ever found. This right here is one of the biggest diamond mines ever found. And if you don't realize what, the disciples should have realized, blessed are your eyes because you've seen these things right here. Completed and perfected by God and preserved for you. The New Testament alone preserved for you for 2,000 years. 
nearly 2,000 years it's been preserved for you. And you're holding this perfect word of God in your hands. Blessed are your eyes if you see these things. This, one of the last things I'll try to mention is that the need that I'm speaking of or seeking to speak of, of it, about it being great is that we, we are called to go forth and preach uh, this gospel that Jesus uh, gave us, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That men would be, uh, that the, the sword of the word of God would actually pierce through men's hearts and that they, that as, as dead men, would be put on the cross with the Lord Jesus, that their man of sin would be crucified there, that they would be buried with the Lord Jesus, and then they'd be raised to walk in newness of life. And then do you know God's plan for them after that? Do you know God's plan and purpose? This is actually, you know, some, when you ask this question, especially if you ask people in general, I love asking actually atheists this question, but do you believe there's a purpose for your life? Do you believe you're here for a reason? The reason I love asking is that most of them say yes. And, and I think that's humorous because how can you have a reason? How can you have a purpose if there is no God? But most people will say, I don't know what I'm here for. I actually asked the man at the, uh, at the hospital that he's like 45, and he said, I'm still trying to figure it out. I was like, are you going to wait till you're dead to figure it out? Why you're here? Next day, I talked to like an 18, 19-year-old uh, girl, I could say. She wasn't a woman, a girl. Um, she just was kind of immature spiritually, but she just said, I'm 18. I'm, I'm, I'm young. I haven't figured that out yet. You know, I'm too young to figure that out. I'm like, well, don't feel too bad. I just talked to a 45 year old yesterday and he doesn't know either. So the, so yeah, we, we might talk about these specific things that God has for us. And he does like you in this church, you have a purpose and you have a, a reason that God has put you here. But overall, God is working all things together for good in your life that he may conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. He's, he's working all things together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. And verse 29 of chapter 8 says, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son. So that's, that's the end goal of every single person that comes to Christ is that they would be conformed into the image of Christ. It's the same thing with you. God wants to make you into the image of Christ. And in this way, as you're made into the image of Christ, you end up and you should be provoking others to be like Christ. Amen. And you know what happens when it happens in a church? Because each one of you are supposed to be gifted by the Spirit of God. It's not just a preacher that's gifted, but each one of you is supposed to be gifted by the Spirit of God severally as, severally as he wills, as it says in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. The Spirit of God gives gifts unto men so that you would be used in this church. Not only will you become like Christ, but you will cause others to become like Christ. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's you. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying the body of Christ. That's what he gives prophets and teachers and apostles and all of them. Edify them. What does that mean? Build up. Build up unto what, though? Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. The great need that God sees in the world is that people are dying without Christ and they're going to hell. But at the same time, the image of God, which God has created us all in, and we've fallen from that broken image. God wants to restore that in men. And when he restores it in men and women, he causes them to become like Christ. 
That's the end goal. And if you're failing in any wise in this regard, then you are actually bringing your church down. Because your church needs you to be like Christ. So that they can become like Christ. And the whole goal of God for your church is that the whole church would look like Christ. Be his body. You're only as strong as your weakest link, so to speak. Think of it that way. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the end of verse 13, 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, whom, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Every joint. Not just some, every joint. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that she henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Now praise God, he actually shows you the purpose of God for an individual Christian. He shows you the purpose of God for an individual church. And then he actually shows you like what it looks like to be like Christ. Um, and, and he says, I say there as a testify of the prisoner of the Lord that you walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that still, still no more. Or stole, still no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may be able to give to him that needeth. That's why we work now, to give to those who need, not to buy things for ourselves. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edifying, the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the, unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ hath forgiven you. Gloriously speaking, in the first part of this chapter about what God's plan is for the church, you see that it's the same plan that it is for the individual Christian. And then he wants the whole church to be looking like Christ. That is the power of the gospel. That is what it's supposed to be caused to do. And as this church becomes like Christ, it becomes a glorious representation to all the world, a light to all the world. Jesus says, you're a light. You're a light. You're the light of the world. A city on a, uh, on a hill cannot be hid. Men don't light a lamp, put it under a bushel. The whole desire of the church becomes a, 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 a burning and shining light to all the world. This great need that is needed in the world, that, the, that the, the harvest is great and the labors are few. How is it going to be met? By labors being raised up. Labors, what kind of labors? Not labors that look like themselves, but labors that look like Christ. And you should go forth as one man, as a mighty army, taking this world, turning it upside down. I don't know if you've ever looked at uh, what a church is, a local New Testament church in Scripture. But it is an amazing revelation. It says in 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you know that you as a local church are a spiritual house? Do you know that you are of a holy priesthood? Amen. Do you know that you're supposed to be offering up spiritual sacrifices to God? Peter 2, 9, 1 Peter 2, 9 uh, through 12 says, You're a chosen generation also. You're a royal priesthood. You're a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In which time past you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 
and had not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, he says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest amongst the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may behold, or they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. First Corinthians 12 again says that a church is a body of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through tw uh, 21, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, and who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18 says, Be ye not unequally, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Not just some of us are ambassadors, but all of us, all of you in this local church are to be ambassadors. You're to cry unto men and women as though Christ was right there in front of them and saying, be ye reconciled to God. You as a local church, a true local lampstand that is supposed to be perfected into the image of Christ, you actually have no fellowship with darkness. You're not unequally yoked with unbelievers. You're the temple of the living God, and you have, should have nothing to do with idols. The very uh, nature of the church, if you understand what it is, is the ecclesia. It means being called out. Called out to assemble. What are you called out of? What are you called out of? Called out of sin? Called out of the world? So basically, the Lord like works through you to, to, to go out into the world. <laughs> go out into the world. The, that, that's all the world out there. Okay. This is the church in here. God calls you to not stay in here amongst yourselves, but he calls you just like he did with you. He calls you to go out into the world. And if you don't know what to say, just read it straight from Scripture. Wherefore, come out from among them and separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And God says he will receive you and he'll be a father unto you and you will be his sons and his daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Come out from the world and assemble with God's people, assemble with God's church. Be a shining and burning light to the world instead and turn men from wickedness unto righteousness. Praise God. That's what God's called you to do. To come out from the world, be separate, and then go out and call others to come out and be separate and assemble with the people of God. And another thing that it mentions that you are as a church of God is the bride of Christ. You can say, you say they come out. God wants to adopt, adopt you as a son or daughter, but he also wants you as, as his bride. He wants to woo you unto himself. Be the beautiful bride of Christ, a chaste virgin unto God. When you come to Christ, he becomes your first love. And you know what he says actually to the, the church at Ephesus? He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. They're doing all these things, doing all these works, but they're not, they've left Jesus Christ as their first love. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Isn't that interesting? Plural. Do the first works that you did when I first saved you. What are those works? 
It's really interesting. I, I, I had to think about this, and I, and I think it really is in simplicity. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what he said. So what would the first works really look like, I would think? I would think it would look like loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Undoubtedly, God actually saves us, I believe, in a real sense to pray unto him. Scripture says the prayer of the wicked basically is an abomination unto the Lord. You ever thought about that? God, when, when, when your father, you know, when, when he becomes your father, you actually start having communication with him. Your son communicates with you, does he not? Yeah. So we start to talk to God. We can't help but talk to God. We can't help but want to hear from God. And I would say, thirdly, we can't help but speak to others about God. Maybe in a carnal way, your son will say, well, my dad's stronger than your dad. But in a sense, we, 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 they brag on their dad, don't they? So we, as, when you're truly saved, I would say that one of those first works is that you just can't help because you love, because you love the Lord Jesus so much, you cannot help but want to hear from him. You'll be like Mary when Martha's cumbered about all, all kinds of things. You'll be like Mary wanting to sit at the feet of Jesus and drink in his word. And Jesus said, one thing is needful. She's chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And you'll want to speak unto the Lord. You want to pray without ceasing. And also, you want to just tell others about your wonderful Savior. That's what God did with me. I'm just a worm. God saved me. God took me out of wickedness, such great wickedness, such darkness. And after that, all I, could do, all I wanted to do is speak to him. All I wanted to do was hear from him. And really, all I couldn't help but do, even though people almost wanted to probably put duct tape on my mouth, wanted to tell them about Christ, this awesome Savior. And guess what? Just as an individual, God will work in an individual that way. A whole church can be guilty of getting away from that. Yeah, this is the great need. The great need is the great harvest. And that we would cry unto God the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. But we'd also think about that in gold. God wants to write their names in heaven, and he wants to conform you as an individual into Christ, and he wants to conform your church into the image of Christ. Please do study what it is to be a church in Scripture. And I would encourage you also to write out just a statement or a paragraph what you come away with. Um, I'll give you an example. I, 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 I wrote this as what I was thinking about. It says, why are good biblical churches needed? A biblical church, okay, is a bride of Christ. It is his lampstand, and it is called the light of the world. It is an integral component of God's ordained means of the salvation of souls and seeing men and women conformed into the image of Christ. It is used by God to change lives for all eternity. It is a military outpost warring against the gates of hell and pushing back the devil's influence on this lost and dying world. It is a theological training ground. It sends soldiers of Christ to drop the atomic bomb of the gospel into the devil's den and utterly destroy his devices. The local church is the means by which God brings saints together to be of one mind, one heart, and one voice to worship him in spirit and truth and to strive together for the faith of the gospel. After you describe maybe heaven or hell to someone and they, you describe to them the truth of the word of God and it's just absolutely irrefutable. And then you say, do you want to go to heaven? And they say, no. Doesn't that like make no sense at all? And you're just broken maybe like why? That makes no sense. Why would you want to go to hell for all eternity when God wants to save you? In another way, I'll just ask you the last thing I'll say. If you know what a true biblical church is, like why wouldn't you want to be there? yourselves and at the same time why wouldn't you want to see him planted all over this earth at the same time if you said no then i'd be like that makes no sense see how glorious the church is how glorious is the work that god does in an individual and puts them a part of a band of believers it's amazing the need is great how are we going to answer the need praise god let's pray Father.